It's, uh, it's an honor to be able to take this day to share the word with you. Um, and, and we're in the middle of a series, and if you've been with us over the last little while, we've been walking through this series forward, and there are kind of three sections to this series, and we're right in the middle. We're right in the middle part, and we're, we're, uh, we're talking about, uh, the first part of our series was talking about praying first, and we kind of set that up with the importance of prayer and the foundation of, of prayer. Now we're in the, in the middle of the series where we're talking about what it means to trust God completely. To completely trust God in our lives and for what he has for us. And in a, in a couple of weeks, we're going to walk into the next part of this. is going to be talking about stepping boldly. But this morning, uh, we're going to be looking in God's word. And, and kind of the title, I guess, you could, you could put on this one is, is, the, is simply this. The fruit of trust. The fruit of trust. We're, we're talking about trusting completely. And we're going to see what that fruit of trust is in just a moment and what that word is. If you were with us last Sunday, Pastor Bruce spoke uh, from Luke, I think it was 19, on, on the story of Zacchaeus. And I thought for a minute he was going to break out the Sunday school song that I sang growing up. And I don't know where you're from or if you sang this song, but it was something like Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree. I thought you were going to sing it, Pastor Bruce. I was waiting. I even had the key ready to go. Uh, maybe next time we won't miss that opportunity, okay? But uh, we looked at the story of Zacchaeus last week, and we talked about, the, uh, uh, Pastor Bruce led us in a, t- in a topic that talked about that, the fact that trust is the fuel that propels movement, and that we can trust completely because God is trustworthy, amen? We can trust completely because God is trustworthy, and let that be the foundation of where we're going today, that we can trust in God completely because our God is trustworthy. Worthy. This morning we're going to continue our conversation of what it is to trust completely. And if I can be completely transparent with you this morning, it's, it was not an easy message for me to prepare. Uh, sometimes it's easier than others. It's never easy, but sometimes it's easier than other times. This was not one of those times. I'm just, I'm just being honest. Uh, I think it was Dr. Charles Stanley was quoted as saying, if you preach from your weakness, you'll never run out of material. And, uh, and I felt like that was true for me this week as I was preparing. Uh, and so I humbly uh, just ask God to speak through me today. And the word I want to share with you this morning, I've been, honestly, I've been preaching this to myself all week, all week long. And, uh, and, and I'm just trusting that the Holy Spirit will use me in my weakness today that's, so we can all, myself included, be made more like Jesus. Amen, anyone? Amen, that's the goal. So just a a quick introduction to our text before we we dive in there. We're going to be reading from the book of James, the book of James. And before we do, you see, there are a number of men in the New Testament with the name James. There are a number of different Jameses in the New Testament. But we have reliable historical evidence concerning the identity of James the one that wrote this letter that we're reading from today. This is a man that some called James the Just. He was a man that eventually rose to lead the church in Jerusalem, uh, and he was a leader in the church, almost like an overseer or a pastor. But without a doubt, the most notable thing about James is that he was raised in the same household as Jesus. That's because he was the brother of Jesus the earthly brother of Jesus. I guess you could say half-brother of Jesus. He was one of the brothers that was born to Joseph and Mary. And actually, they had had sisters too. Jesus grew up with not just brothers, but he had to put up with sisters as well, okay? (laughs) So he developed patience at an early age. I only have one sibling, and she's a sister, and I love her to death. This was also the James that the Apostle Paul speaks of who got a special post-resurrection visit from Jesus, okay? After Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus, uh, uh, it was noted that Jesus appeared to various groups and various people, and it actually is noted that he made an appearance to James. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6 to 7, and this is not a part of my message, so don't, don't start timing me yet. This is for free, okay? After that, it says, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, and verse 7 says, then he appeared to James... Singular, James, he appeared to James, and then to the, all the apostles. So James got a special visit from Jesus after the resurrection. And we don't know for sure, but it's very possible, it's very possible that this may have been the moment when James fully put his trust in Jesus to be his savior. 
Because then the reason why I say that is because we happen to know that none of Jesus' earthly brothers, during Jesus' ministry, none of his brothers believed he was the Messiah. They didn't even believe it. They couldn't believe it. And, 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 and it even is recorded in, in the book of John, chapter 7 and verse 5, it says, For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Just think about it for a minute. If you were the brother of the Messiah or the sister of the Messiah, what would they have to do to prove to you that they were the son of God? I mean, it would be a hard sell, right? It would be a hard sell, perhaps. But he, uh, his brothers didn't believe. This is referring to his earthly brothers. And I believe us having this understanding about James is so important and it makes it even more amazing that James says in his introduction to the text we're going to look at today, he says, he introduces himself as this. He says, James, I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now he's coming from a place where he didn't believe even while Jesus was in his ministry, active ministry, but after Jesus' death and resurrection and appearing to James, James now believed. And he now, in this letter, he actually introduces himself as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that word servant is a Greek word that we see throughout scripture quite often is the word doulos, which is better translated bond servant. And a bond servant was someone who willingly, get this, willingly dedicated their life to their master. It was someone who willingly dedicated their life to their master. They would say, you know what, I have a good master. I choose to serve him or, uh, for the rest of my life. And so what's interesting here is that James identifies himself as being a lifelong servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. What James is doing here, he's expressing his devotion and his service in such a way as to put God and Jesus on an equal plane. When James says, I am a servant of God and Jesus, he's putting them together, which is pretty incredible. Something had to have happened. Something had to have happened in James' life, the brother of Jesus, to get from a, go from a place where he didn't believe to a place where he accepted Jesus to be his savior. And not only that, but he dedicated his life to the, even the point of death later in his life to serving him. And he put his complete trust and his full trust in Jesus. James and the other brothers didn't believe Jesus during his ministry, but after they seen him die on a cross and rise again, they trusted completely in Jesus as Messiah. So James says, I'm a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's writing this letter to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Some of you are familiar what might have happened or what did happen. You might be familiar with what did happen in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2 when thousands of Jewish people put their faith in Jesus. Thousands came to faith. Thousands were baptized. And in the weeks and months ahead, there were thousands more who came to faith and were baptized. The church, the scripture tells us the church was growing in number daily. The followers of Jesus. The church was growing daily and people were rejoicing Excuse me, but then all of a sudden it says in our text, if we understood so that scripture, it tells us that the trials and the testing came their way in the form of persecution. And for thousands of Jewish followers of Jesus, they were now forced to leave Jerusalem and to be scattered into the known world all across the land. They scattered because of the persecution and they go all over the place and it's tough for them wherever they go because when the Jewish people who are now followers of Christ went into other areas where it was mainly, um, I guess, populated by Gentile believers, then they weren't accepted there. Or if they went to places that were Jewish believers, but they weren't really accepted there because they've accepted now a new way. And so wherever they went, they're finding life is tough and faith is tougher. And then after this first verse of introduction, a quick introduction, James dives right into the text. He dives right into the message that he wants to share with his listeners. It's a quick intro and then right into the topic at hand. He ain't messing around. Turn to someone next to you and say, he ain't messing around. 
He ain't messing around. I'm telling you, he ain't messing around. And I'm convinced of two things. As I've studied this, as I've read this, as I've internalized this, as I've prayed about this, I am convinced of two things about the text we're gonna read this morning, look at today and unpack. One, it's so true, this text that we're about to read, it's so true and we need to follow these instructions. I believe it with all my heart that it's true and we need to follow it. I believe it, it's the way that Jesus wants us to live. But secondly, as we read it, I want to admit the truth of the matter is that it's hard as well, and we often don't live this way. So it's true, and we should live that way, but it's hard, and we often don't, because it's hard, all right? Quick, quick observation, I know it's deep, I know it's deep theolo- theology here this morning, but that's, that's just two overarching uh, observations. Goes into verse two. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, first of all, here are some truths about trouble that James alludes to in this text, or trials that he's talking about. Now, I know this, this already, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials, joy, trials, this already, pastor, you're not making any sense. I'm not sure if I can, I can follow this already, but, but let's, let's stay in it, let's follow along. But here are some truths about, about trials truths about troubles that we face in life. First of all, we're reminded in this verse that troubles are unavoidable. Troubles are unavoidable. It says whenever you face troubles. It's not if you face troubles, it's when you face troubles, right? The verse in the, in the New, New Living Translation says when troubles come. It's not if troubles come your way, but it's when troubles come your way. James actually was not the first to say this, and he's not the only one to say this. Jesus himself once said, in this world you will have trouble. But he went on to encourage the reader by saying, and the listener by saying, but take heart, because I have overcome the world. But he identified the fact that in this world you will have trouble. Peter, Peter said, don't be surprised when trouble comes your way. You You shouldn't be surprised by that. Because it's going to happen. It's a part of this life. Nobody is immune or insulated from facing trouble. So we now know that troubles are unavoidable. Secondly, James tells us in this verse, he's describing the fact that troubles are diverse. Double, uh, troubles are diverse. Whenever you face trials of what? Many kinds. Many kinds. He's saying the troubles that you're going to face, they're diverse. There's a wide range You see, troubles, they are not all alike. They're not the same. They vary, and they can be of many kinds. Not only are there many types of troubles, but troubles can vary in intensity. They can vary in frequency. They can vary in in duration. We don't know how long they're going to last sometimes. Some troubles we face can be simply, you know, a flat tire on the way to work and, and, and which might seem huge in the moment and very inconvenient and troublesome. Or, or, or maybe some of you woke up yesterday morning, looked out your window, and all you seen was trouble, right? Very true. And maybe, maybe you've had to, to, to deal with that. <laughs> you know, maybe it was the first time you've seen anything like that and... Trouble, man. They're very diverse. And maybe that's one end of the trouble spectrum, you know. Inconveniences, things that come our way, that we say, oh, that's, that's trouble, that's a trial. But then there's the other side of the spectrum of trouble where there's life-altering, life-changing trouble that we face. Where there's, you know, deep and wide kind of trouble that we face where a snowstorm or a flat tire seems like very minute compared to the trouble that you may be facing or have faced. So there's a wide range. There's, troubles are, are diverse, right? Thirdly, James alludes to the fact that troubles are unpredictable. They are unpredictable. Another version of the text says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, when you fall into it. 
It's the word uh, in, in scripture is translated as the same word used in the story of the Good Samaritan where, where, the, where the, the man is on his way to Jerusalem and he falls into, he fell into a band of robbers. In other words, it was something that he wasn't anticipating. It was something that came out of nowhere. It, it, you know, it's rare that we're ever prepared for trouble to come. We don't, often we don't expect it to come. It just kind of happens. We kind of fall into it, so to speak. We can't schedule trouble. It often comes at the most inopportune times. So troubles are unpredictable. We don't know when it's going to happen. So James is telling us that our troubles are unavoidable. He's telling us that they're diverse. And he's telling us that troubles are unpredictable. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? <laughs> You're thinking, I cleared all that snow so I could come here and hear this? <laughs> I hope you're encouraged. <laughs> Welcome to Bethesda. We're a church that just loves to encourage you. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. But here's the truth, church. Here's the truth. Do you know that sitting in this room right now, or listening online, sitting in this room right now are people who are just striving to hang on to their faith? I know that. That there are people in a room this size that are just striving to hang on to their face. I, I mean, you might not think so. You might not think so because most of us do a good job at concealing the struggle, right? Most of us do a pretty good job at covering it up and, and making it look a certain way so people don't know or see the trouble or the struggle that we're facing. But I recognize this morning that I know there are people in this room and people watching online today that you're in the middle of something right now and you're striving just to hang on. Some are striving to hang on to their marriage. Some are struggling to hang on to their sobriety. There are people who are struggling in, in, in this season of grief that has come because of the passing of someone you love dearly. Some are struggling to hang on in the midst of an illness that has plaguing them for far too long. It's just been going on and going on and going on. Some are struggling to because, because you or someone you love has received a diagnosis that, that you had, had hoped that you would never hear the words. But you're in the middle of that and, and, and you're striving right now because of what's come your way. Or maybe you're here this morning, you're listening and, and you're a parent who's trying your best but it seems that no matter how hard you try or even you know, how much you've prayed, you have a child or a grandchild or someone close to you who has found themselves in a place that you never imagined that they would be. And you're struggling with that. It's heavy, it's hard. It's a trial. Some of you are striving to hang on because of, of financial pressure. You're not sure how you're gonna continue to provide for your family or, or not sure how you're gonna get out of debt. Some are sitting in the room today struggling to hang on to their faith, which at one time maybe seemed like it was great and, and easy and, and amazing, but maybe lately it's been more of a struggle for you. To people who are here today with heaviness of heart or with a shattered spirit or a fading faith, I believe God has brought you here today to hear a word from, from, from Scripture, to hear his word today, and an important word from the book of James. And this word that we're going to talk about specifically is this word, persevere. Persevere. Everyone say persevere. persevere. And it, be, it can be hard to understand how we are supposed to consider it all joy when troubles come. Those can be hard words to hear when you're right in the middle of a struggle, right? Those can be hard words to hear when you're right in the middle of a difficult season in your life where you may even wonder, you know, where is God? How come he's not showing up? How am I going to get through this? But James is telling us that troubles, while they're unavoidable, they're diverse, and they're unpredictable. But he also explains the fact that troubles are purposeful. Troubles are purposeful. He's saying that stress and suffering can serve a purpose in our lives if we can have the right perspective. And that's the fourth point. The troubles are purposeful. There's a purpose behind the problem. But how? How can trouble be good? 
Trouble by its very definition is not good, right? But this next part shows us in verse three and four, there's a few reasons why trouble is purposeful in our lives and can in some ways also be good for us. James says in verse three, he goes on to say, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. James is saying, consider it. He's saying, take a deliberate look at it and see how this trial can be a blessing. Now, church, don't hear what I'm not saying today. We don't consider the trial a joy, right? We don't need to, con- you know, but we need to consider what can come as a result of the trial to be joy. We're not thanking God for the storm or for the difficult situation that we find ourselves in, but we, we don't thank God for the illness or for the job loss or for the unexpected term, term of, turn of events. We don't thank God for the trial, but we consider what he can do in us through this trial that we're facing. There's a difference. And we need to understand that. Because pain is always the pathway to growth. Pain is always the pathway to growth. That's something not, that's hard to say amen to, but we know it's true. That pain is always a pathway to growth. We've heard this, this statement, right? No pain, no gain. We've heard that, and, and, and it's so true, and we understand that. No pain, no gain. We all wish we could gain muscle tone without lifting weights and going to the gym endlessly, or we could lose those few extra pounds by, without having to put in some cardio and, and forsake some of the foods that we love so much that we probably shouldn't be indulging in. Those things, without pain, there's no gain, there's no, there's no growth. Or we wish we could, we could just become wise without, without reading and, and without studying, without going through life and, and learning and all of these things. We wish we could experience gain without the pain, right? We want the gain, but we don't, want, we don't like the pain. But life doesn't work like that. Let's be honest, we know life's not like that. There's no gain in your life physically, relationally, and certainly not spiritually without some pain. That was even true for Jesus. It's even true for Jesus. There's no empty tomb without a bloodstained cross. We don't get to choose our trials in life. We don't get to choose when they come or how they come. However, we can choose our attitude toward them and how we see our trials and the perspective of which we have when we're going through our trials. If our desire is to be mature, like the scripture said a moment ago, if our desire is to be mature and complete in our faith, it's going to require perseverance. It's going to require perseverance. I invite, well, the team can get ready and come back whenever they'd like. Not quite done, but But the word testing here, when we just read in this verse, is actually a word used for refining metals, precious metals. Uh, In refining metals, you had to burn off the impurities, right? You've probably heard this, you've probably seen this. If not, it's a science lesson, you know? So what you have to do is if you have gold or silver and and they want, if you wanna get that to a pure state of gold or silver, it needs to be put under extreme heat. And has to be, be melted down. And when it's under extreme heat, it melts. And the impurities are burned off. And what's left at the end is pure gold. Right? And it's pure silver. Right now, maybe you're feeling the heat in your life. Maybe you know what it's like to go through seasons where you feel the heat. Where you feel that refining process that's taking place in your life. One of the first things that trouble will do is, is that it will test your faith. One of the first things a trial will do is to test your faith. And the question you're going to have to grapple with, and kind of what we're talking about this morning in the overarching theme of our text, is what you're going to have to grapple with is, is simply this. Am I going to trust God? Am I going to put my complete trust in God? 
Am I going to do that? When troubles come, when my faith is stretched and I feel the weight, the answer, you know, the, the, the answer that God is looking for is not, you know, oh, oh I understand God, or, or, you know, or this makes sense, or, or, or maybe if I look at it differently, it will be easy. No, 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 because often we don't understand. We don't, it doesn't make sense, and it's certainly not easy, but in those moments when your faith is put to the test, our answer should be, God, I trust you. God, my, my complete trust is in you. I don't see what's around the corner. I don't really know what's ahead. I don't know how I'm gonna get there. I don't know what you're doing in, in my life through this right now, but I trust you. I, I put my complete trust in God because you are trustworthy. He's trustworthy. Amen? He's trustworthy. Verse 12 tells us, in James 1, it says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. There's a reward in trusting God completely. There's a reward in persevering even through the difficulties and trials of life. When you're tempted to give up, when you're tempted to give in, when you're tempted to try to take matters into your own hands and, and not fully trust God, because sometimes, see, we can say, God, I, on, a, on a Sunday, we can, we can come to church and say, yep, God, that situation, I'm gonna trust you in that, and then we leave, and Monday morning, we try to do it ourselves. We try to figure it out in our own strength, right? Or we say, God, you know, this financial situation I'm in, I, I'm gonna trust you with it. I know you're a provider. I'm gonna continue to be faithful. And then Monday, you're doing things that are shady to try to get ahead. That's not how this works. That's not completely trusting God. But God is saying, put your complete trust in me. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, the person will receive the crown of life that is promised to him. Remember this morning, church, his promises are yes and amen. His promises are yes and amen. Promises like, like from, from scripture, like I am with you always. That's a promise from God today. Maybe you need to hold on to. Promises from God that, that say, you know, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Promises when he says, you know what? I'm as close as the mention of my name. That when you need him, you can just call on Jesus and he's there. He promises us that. The promise that his grace is sufficient for you, even when it might not feel that way. If we trust him, his grace is sufficient. If you're in the middle of a trial right now, I want us to remember, I want you to know that Jesus understands what you're in. He understands what you're feeling. He understands pain, he understands disappointment. He understands hurt. He, understand, he understood rejection. He understands loneliness. He understands grief. He understands suffering. Jesus, he understands. He too had to persevere. And he did so all the way to the cross. Every time he was beaten scorned, spit on, when he took the 39 lashes that tore into his back, all hell was screaming, quit, just stop. It wanted him to stop, just to quit. When the nails went into his hands and when the nails went into his feet, you know, when people were ridiculing him and mocking him, everything inside of him must have been just saying, just quit, just quit. Just call this whole thing off. It's not worth it. That's what the enemy wanted. I actually remember a song growing up, and some of you might know it, uh, a long, long time ago. I, I remember hearing this song that said, he could have called 10,000 angels. And that's coming out of Matthew 26, 53. It's in scripture. He could have called 10,000. He could have called this whole thing off. The suffering, the pain, the strife, the ridicule, the things that he was under, the pressure, he could have called it all off and given up and quit because he didn't have to do it. 
But because of his love for you and because of his love for me, he persevered and he died a death that made it possible for us to have salvation and forgiveness, come on church, to be able to experience transformation. Are you thankful for that today? To have new life in Jesus, to have new life in Christ with an eternal hope for a crown of life. All because of what he did. All because of him persevering through the pain and what he did. I am so thankful that we have a savior that persevered to the end, amen? So church, persevere. We need to persevere. We need to persevere. And I understand it. I know that there are people in this room today, you've, heard, you've earned your doctorate in perseverance. I feel so underqualified to even speak on this topic because I know the stories of so many of you in this place. I know the stories of so many people who have went through so much in their lives and had to, have had to persevere through trial after trial after trial. I know some of your stories. You've had more than your fair share of pain and problems and trials, and I've seen this lived out uh, and livened in color in so many people's lives over, over the last number of years that I've been here especially. And isn't it true isn't it true that the people that you remember the most, this is true for me, the people who you remember the most are people of faith that, that you think, wow, I, I, I wanna have faith like that. I wanna have faith like that. And the people that inspire us the most aren't the people who've had it all easy and it's been success after success after success, but the people who inspire you the most, inspire me the most, are the ones who've in the middle of their trial remain faithful in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the hurt, who persevered, who stayed the course, who found purpose in their pain. Isn't it true that those people are the people we remember the most? I mean, growing up, I, I, I can tell you stories of individuals that just stand out to me in my mind. When I was thinking about this, just, just the tears filled my eyes because I thought of the story of Ron. A, a, a man I know from my hometown in Gander and what he has went through in his life, but yet at the end of it all, he's still able to say, God, you're good, you're faithful. Wow. I've been able to tell you a story about a man named John from a, a previous church I pastored who lived his life in chronic pain, but yet would not give in and just simply said, your grace is sufficient. Your grace is sufficient. I ask God that he'll take this thorn from my flesh, but if he don't, I will serve him till the end of my life. You know people like that. And they're the people that through the middle of trial, through the middle of pain, through the middle of sickness, they can live their lives in such a way that they find purpose and still are able to fix their eyes on Jesus. That's the kind of faith I want to have. That's the kind of trust I want to have in a God who's with me, in a God who's able to help us to persevere, in a God who said, in the end, he'll be blessed. I have a reward. I know there's gonna be pain. I know there's gonna be trouble. I know there's gonna be trials in this life, but if you just hang on, if you just hang on and remain steadfast, then there's a reward. And those are the people that, that just stand out to me and that inspire me the most. Maybe for you right now, right now is an especially intense season of your life. Maybe you feel like this topic and, and, and through this, God, you know, through his word today, this, this, this word is kind of where you are. It's, it's for you today. Maybe for some people, you're, you're, you've been on the verge of just giving up or losing faith. I want to encourage you to consider today. With God's help, with God's help, the fact that you're gonna persevere. And you're gonna press on by God's grace. And you're gonna keep moving forward. If any of that describes you today, I would love the opportunity in a moment to pray for you. I'm gonna ask you to stand as we go to prayer in a moment. But before we do, if
if that's you today, I just, I just sense that God just wants us just to be still for a moment. Physically, mentally, everything, just be still. Just to be still. To sense his presence. To sense his power that's available to you today. To strengthen you, to help you. Because at the end of my life, I want to be able to look back and say, when I went through the difficult storms, when I went through the trials, it wasn't easy, I didn't welcome it, I didn't like the trial, I didn't find joy in the trial itself. But man, what God did in my life through that, I would never have been able to experience otherwise. That's why we can sing songs like we sing, like the hymn that says, it is well with my soul. The writer of that song, I won't go into all the details, the writer of that song who began the lyrics of that song tragically lost his wife, or tragically lost his four children. His wife survived in a boat that sunk in the Atlantic Ocean. And then as he was going to, across the pond, we say, to meet up with his wife, as he was passing over that area, the captain told him, this is the area where the ship sank and your children went down. And as he passed over that place, he penned the words, it is well. In the middle of severe pain and trial, he was able to say it is well. Can you say that today? In the middle of what you're in, in the middle of what we face, as a believer in Christ today, if you're a follower of Jesus, can we with confidence and our trust in him say, God, it is well. Although I'm in the middle of pain, although I'm hurting, although it's difficult, I'm gonna trust you as well. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Before we pray, let's just sing those words a few times. It is well. It is well. With my soul. planning to do this, but I just feel the opportunity should be given. If you're here this morning and you would just like to put your trust in God or, or you're, you're wanting to step forward in your faith today, 
you want to trust completely. Maybe there's something going on in your situation, in your life right now, or someone you love, or, and you just want to step out and have our pastors come and pray with you. We would love to create a moment for you to do that today as we sing this once again. You can come forward to the front here and we'll, we'll pray with you. Uh, for those visit, uh, listening online, we're praying with you. We, we thank you for your presence today. You can let us know if there's something that we can be praying for. God bless you. Hey, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we just hope that you enjoyed the service. So glad that you're here. Uh, of course, at Bethesda, uh, we're all about next steps. And so we want to help you take your next step in your faith journey, no matter where you are. And so to do that, simply text the word NEXT to 709-701-3336, and we'll be sure to follow up with you. Again, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again real soon.